What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Atheist Roundtable. Yeah. It is another Tart Live Debate Night. Uh, I'm Oz. I know you're sick of seeing my face and hearing my voice this weekend, but glad to have you. And uh got a special uh, host with me tonight, Eddie Kroom. What's up, man? What's up? How you doing? Chilling, chilling, man. Good to have you. Um, uh, well, before you go any further, uh, anybody doesn't know who Eddie is, Eddie has his own YouTube channel. Uh, since you last minute uh, jumped on and helped me, uh, take a second, plug away. Where, where can they find you? What, what do you got going on? Yeah, uh, yeah, I've got like a million followers. Um <laughs> Uh, brute facts on uh youtube i go live every tuesday at um 7 p.m central and got um david ochopsky with ratio christie coming on tomorrow and um trying to get pasta mic on y'all need to start a uh get pasta mic on hashtag he's too hashtag. yeah <laughs> he's uh he's the epitome of the uh what was it lil wayne said real g's moving silence like lasagna <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we had uh we had a really really awesome uh weekend uh here at tart and i won't go through uh every single show but uh hopefully you caught the debate on friday night everybody that one was epic uh <clears throat> and uh t t tonight's will be uh awesome as well but i do want to plug one thing real quick so uh for those that know jenna belk uh she is uh she's pregnant and they're expecting in uh first week of july and we have a uh, we have a paypal set up just for uh this we're doing like a raffle to where uh, you you pick the what you think the date of birth is going to be. So again, first week of July. So you kind of have a ballpark there, and uh, you pick that. If you correct, if you guess the correct date, uh, whatever we collect, we're going to give the winner uh, ten percent, and the rest goes to the Belk family to help uh, with with that. Because you know, middle of a pandemic and all that, it's tough, and especially when it's your first child. Uh, for those that have kids, you know, the first one uh, can be can be a little more expensive because you don't have hand me downs and you know all that stuff there. So I just want to make sure we uh, plug that. Uh, Jen is a great friend of the show, and we want to try to uh, help us help as much as we can. But that's if it's going to be a girl. Oh boy, let me tell you, I got I got two little girls, and they. Uh, it's, they, they're little princesses. They, I they want it all. <laughs> I love my girls, but, uh, man, they call some money. <laughs> yep. Uh, so we, we have a, uh, we have a good debate tonight and I want to give a little background before we, uh, bring, uh, Randolph and, uh, Gavin on. So, uh, they had a debate with us, um, I, I want to say two, a month and a half ago, right around there, ballpark and toward, it, it was on, uh, it's got a moral monster. And towards the end of it, the Ten Commandments came up, and Randolph said, "Actually, I don't, I don't like any of them. I don't agree with any of them." You know, uh, and that brought it up. And then now we're back for round two, so it's on the Ten Commandments with the backdrop being, uh, you know, that debate. So kind of everybody understands how uh, how we got there. But uh, I've been looking forward to this. They, we've had this booked uh, for several weeks, uh, so let's uh, let's bring these gentlemen on screen. What's going on? So we have, we have uh, Gavin, we have Randolph. Gentlemen, how are you this evening? Doing well, thank you. And yourself? I'm, I'm, I'm ready to kick ass. I hope you guys are too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so Gavin, uh, real quick, just tell everybody a little bit about you. Uh, if there's any places that you want to uh, uh, want them to go to find you. Um. Oh, well, actually, <laughs> if you ever come to New Zealand, <laughs> <laughs> if you ever come to New Zealand, make sure you um, come down and check out the uh, Liga uh, Kung Fu and uh, Kickboxing Gym in Newmarket in Auckland. That's where you'll find me. Is it like one of the world's oldest trees in New Zealand? What? Yeah. It's like some tree. It's like really, really old. There, it's real massive. I forgot the name of it. Anyway, Cowrie, Cowrie. Where's Where's Doctor Josh? Where's Doctor Josh? Eddie's yeah. trying to take this off topic. Jeez, it's <laughs> all talk, man. That's it. <laughs> on a break, maybe. Uh, Randolph, how about you? Tell, tell everybody a little bit a little bit about Randolph. Hello, I'm uh, in Canada. Uh, for those who uh, can't see the screen. 
I'm the founding president of an organization here called the Canadian Atheists, and one of our primary aims is to normalize atheism in society so that when people say they don't believe in any deities, um, they don't get uh, vilified for it, uh, just like how it's very common for religious people to say that they believe in deities and there's no crazy reaction. So we just want the same treatment. And uh, of course, we're concerned about uh, human rights and, and whatnot. We're hoping that the normalization will catch on around the world and human rights are an integral part of that. Uh, freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, freedom of conscience, and so on. Um, you can find out more about this organization at www.canadianatheists.ca. I also have a YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash Randolph Richardson. And, and do remember that my name, my first name ends with the letter F, not PH. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Randolph. And uh, the last uh, last person we'll bring on the screen here before we get into the details, uh, we'll bring on the one and only Dr. Josh. I feel like and I'm Dr. trying Josh. to make that face. <laughs> That's what I was trying to think. Uh, when I was doing the video, I was like, I, I need to get, I, I couldn't get a good joke. I need to get a good joke with that video, but I, I couldn't come up with it. But, you but just you, have to you get know. somebody going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can do it. I'm Canadian. <laughs> Canadian, eh? <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Josh, uh, if you want to take a minute and uh, tell everybody about you and where they can find you and what it is that you do. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good to be here. So my wife and I uh, run a YouTube channel called Digital Hammurabi, and uh, we do, you know, I have a PhD in um, ancient Near East and Assyriology uh, with a minor in Hebrew Bible and a master's of theology. So I, I kind of dabble in all that stuff. Uh, and that's what our channel does, talk about the ancient Near East and the background of the Bible um, and then you know, just everything ancient Near East related. So uh, you can find us at Digital Hammurabi. That's Digital H A M M U R A B I, uh, a YouTube channel or digitalhammurabi dot com. And uh, yeah, we have all kinds of cool stuff that we do. And he, and he writes books. And he writes books. Great books. True. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, what we'll do? We'll go through the format here, and then not waste any more time, and uh, get down to business. So, uh, the the format for tonight. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we'll have 10-minute opens, then we'll have a 10-minute uh, cross-examination, then a 40-minute open discussion period, five-minute closes, and then we'll wrap with uh, wrap it up with the uh, uh, Q&A with uh, everybody that's in the in the chat. So, uh, any questions for anybody here before we uh, get it going? I just noticed that Kent Hovind CPA gave you guys a super chat. I just want to say hello. Oh, if it's a, if those are already popping off, I'll do it real quick. Kent Hovind. Oh. No, no, it's Kent Hovind's CPA. Yeah, I know. I was just the name, it, you know. Just... Yeah, we got to be really careful, okay? Because uh, yeah, it's really important to get uh, people correct. Okay? Yeah, I'm here to help. <laughs> wow. <hey. laughs> Can you say something about my shirt in that voice? <laughs> <laughs> that was epic. <laughs> that was Thank a very good impersonation. I'm <laughs> it, it, it was good. We need. I'm glad that's. Uh, that's here live, so I can uh, snip Thank that you out. Would certainly <laughs> approve. <laughs> Uh, but no, thank you, Kent Hobbit CPA, for the uh, uh, super chat. Appreciate it. And then uh, the newest member of the U uh, Tart YouTube channel, Atheist Cats. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Totally thank you, Atheist enough. Cats. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, uh, if nobody has any questions, uh, we will uh, we'll get this party started. All right, I uh, I guess Gavin, you uh, you said you're going to start, right? So uh, have sure, at it. I yeah. think they're going to time you as soon as you start talking. Okay, I'll start now. I just want to say a quick prayer, Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Lord, I pray that you bless uh, Dr. Josh and Randolph and uh, Oz and all the other people involved with this debate, and we pray that um, the truth would come out in the name of your Son Jesus Christ. Amen. So, the topic of the debate tonight is the Ten Commandments. So, I'm taking the positive position um, in that they are true and that they are moral 
and I shall start. So I will start fast and accelerate as per normal. So let's go. The, no other document in world history has changed the world for the better as has the Ten Commandments in the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy from the Bible. Western civilization, the civilization that developed universal human rights, created women's equality, ended slavery, ended slavery, I'll say that twice, and created parliamentary democracy among other unique achievements, would not have been able to do so without these ten prescriptions. As we'll see as we unpack um, the Ten Commandments, they're just as relevant today as a moral code as they were over 3,000 years ago. In fact, they're so relevant that the Ten Commandments are really all that is necessary to develop a good and flourishing world that is free of tyranny and cruelty. So now imagine for a moment a world in which there's no murder, theft, adultery or lying. In such a world, there will be little need for armies, police or weapons. Men and women and children could walk anywhere at any time of day or night without any fear of being killed, raped or robbed or mugged. Imagine further a world in which no one coveted what belonged to their neighbour, a world in which children honoured their mother and father and the family unit flourished and thrived. And I'm talking about the traditional family unit, two parents and children, not uh, single parent families. Uh, and a world in which everybody obeyed the injunction not to lie. So everybody was honest. This would be a good, this would be a great recipe for a good and flourishing world. Um, and that is uh, embedded in these 10 sublime commandments. But, and there's always a but, there is a catch. The 10 commandments are predicated on the belief that they were given by an authority that's higher than any man, any king, any regime or any government. That's why the sentence preceding the Ten Commandments asserts the following. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt where you were slaves. And here's why it was the God of the Bible who spoke these words. If the Ten Commandments were given by just a human authority, then any human being could justifiably say, who is this man Moses or who is this King David or this Queen Esther that I'm reading about in this old book? And who is this government to tell me how I should behave? So why is God indispensable to the Ten Commandments? To be perfectly blunt, if it's not God who declares that murder is wrong, then murder isn't wrong. This will strike some people in the audience watching this as a little bit silly, incomprehensible, or even absurd. And some of you are probably thinking, is Gavin saying you can't be a good person if you don't believe in God? No, I'm not saying that at all. Of course, there are good people, great people who don't believe in God, just as there are bad people who do believe in God. And there will be people watching this debate thinking, well, I believe murder, theft, adultery and lying are wrong, but I don't need the God of the Bible or any God to tell me that. But this is a response that's only sort of half true or lukewarm true. Because I've no doubt that if you're an atheist and you say you believe murder, theft, adultery and lying are wrong, you really do believe murder, theft, adultery and lying are wrong. But the, error, but the reality, excuse me for tripping over my tongue, but the reality is you do need God to tell you because we all need God to tell us. Now, even if you figured out at an early age without any influence, any religious influence or any biblical exposure, if you figured out at an early age on your own that murder, theft, adultery and lying are wrong, how do you know these actions are wrong? Not believe they're wrong, but actually know they're wrong. The fact is you can't, because without God, right and wrong are just personal beliefs, personal opinions that are as common as nostril hairs. Everybody's got them, but they don't mean much. For example, um, John Smith might think that shoplifting is okay, but I don't. Unless there's a God, um, all morality is just opinion and belief. And almost every philosopher, whether secular or theist on the planet, acknowledges this. And I'm talking about philosophers, philosophers like Noam Chomsky and Thomas Nagel. Another problem with um, the view that you don't need God to believe that murder, theft, adultery and lying 
are wrong is because of the human carnage and bloodshed that results from holding the view that you don't need God to tell you what's wrong. All we have to do is look back in history to the French Jacobins, Stalin, Soviet Russia, Hitler's Nazi Germany, Mao Zedong's China, Pol Pot's Cambodia, Mobutu Seko Zaire, which is now called the Democratic Republic of Congo, Idi Amin Uganda's Nikolai Ceausescu's Rat Romania, the 1994 Rwandan genocides where between 500,000 and 600,000 Tutsis were hacked to death with machetes. That was only 27 years ago, for goodness sake. Today we've got China's Xi Jinping and everybody's favorite bad guy, North Korea's Kim Jong-un. Now, these are all stellar examples of the human meat grinder that is only a heartbeat away when mere men push the higher power, the higher authority of God aside and replace God with themselves. So given, man, given mankind's history, um, I wouldn't be too confident about a human being's ability to figure out right from wrong without a high authority. It's very easy to be swayed by a government, a regime, a demagogue, uh, a, a, an ideology like atheism or a media sensation or a movie star to reason that the wrong you are doing isn't really that wrong. And even if you do figure out what is right and wrong, God is still necessary because people who know the difference between right and wrong still do the wrong thing sometimes. Why is that? The reason is because we can. We can because we think no one is watching. But if you recognize that God is the ultimate source of all moral law, you believe that he is always watching. So if you're an atheist, you would still want everybody else to live by the moral laws of the Ten Commandments. I think this is a fact. And even an atheist has to admit that the more people that believe that God prescribed them, and therefore they're not just subject of human opinion, the better the entire world would be. So just to close, in 3,000 years, no one has ever come up with a better system than God's inspired Ten Commandments for making a better more flourishing world, and the fact is no one ever will. And with that, I yield the rest of my time to my learned opponent. Whenever you're ready, Randall, go ahead. Oh, somebody muted me, I see. Okay, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for that, Gavin. Um, we'll get into some of those points later. I'll just begin with my opening statement that I think um, the way it looks to me is that legal systems developed independently of religions and uh, perhaps early attempts at a quasi legal system uh, came in the form of religions in certain cases, um, but they were problematic because they tend to be authoritarian and absolutist. And so they're, they're inflexible. And uh, so, People need to change them. Uh, legal systems need to change with the needs of society. So right off the bat, that's a big problem with the Ten Commandments. They're uh, inflexible and they're not applicable. And uh, in, in many cases, they're also immoral. Exodus 20 from King James Bible is commonly, as I understand it, by many Christians for defining the Ten Commandments. It is defined in different ways in different parts of the Bible but this is kind of the most common one that I've encountered. So it's, it's what I'm going to address. So if you look at Exodus 20, uh, the, the third verse begins with the first commandment, thou shall have no other gods before me. My objection to this is that it limits religious liberty. So uh, if you're a polytheist, you're out. If you're from another religion, you're out. You're not complying with this commandment. And uh, that is, uh, to me, all these things that limit our liberties is immoral and um, uh, unethical. Commandment two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Again, this limits freedom of expression because to make images is an art form. There's, uh, and it goes on to serving and whatnot. Uh, the Lord talks about, gets a little off topic and starts talking about, apparently, about how he is a jealous God. 
And uh, so I, I think that jealousy is clearly incompatible with justice, for justice needs to be impartial and fair. And jealousy uh, is a bias that uh, when it's part of uh, a judicial process, uh, it can result in some very horrible results for people who otherwise would not you need to have things that the the punishment fits the crime and and jealousy can interfere with that process um, it also unfortunately uh, the deity is also promising to punish others without regard for whether they were even involved in the alleged transgression in the first place so it's it's dragging in um, offspring uh, multiple generations of offspring punishing them for that and we look all the way back to Adam and Eve and the story goes that uh, all women are punished with the uh, painful uh, childbirth because Eve ate the apple. The punishment does not fit the crime and it victimizes people who had no say in it and had nothing to do with it. That's immoral and unethical. Commandment three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord of thy Lord of the of the Lord thy God in vain. And the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Um, this limits again freedom of expression and also prevents the deity from being held accountable for his wrongdoings. If you want people to take your laws seriously, they need to have an avenue of redress. Otherwise, it's not a justice system. It's just authoritarian. You do what I say, no questions asked, is, is unethical. And it talks about commandment four. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This limits the freedom of a person to set their own work schedule. Commandment five, honor thy father and, they, and thy mother. So some parents are abusive and do not deserve to be honored. In fact, a really smart, smart, a really sharp example of this would be Isaac, who I think has an excellent reason, justification for not honoring his father, Abraham, who attempted to murder him under God's command, ironically. This God who says in commandment six, the next one, thou shalt not kill. He should have seen that coming. He knows everything after all. By the way, there are scenarios where killing is helpful or necessary. For example, mercy killings on a battlefield, assisted suicide, self-defense, where killing is necessary to defend yourself. So thou shalt not kill does not address these. And the word kill, by the way, um, is used throughout the Bible in the Hebrew version. And it, as I understand, it very clearly means kill in these commandments as well as other places. So God commanding genocide and whatnot, that's a lot of killing. If he's commanding murder, that's pretty bad. Commandment seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. This limits marital freedom. For example, open marriages by requiring police enforcement. Police in the bedroom does not sound good to me. This cannot be a law because married people need to be free to resolve such matters on their own or to seek court assistance as they deem necessary. Commandment eight, thou shalt not steal. Generally a good rule, but it's problematic because it's presented as absolute. It fails to consider, for example, somebody who needs to steal something back from someone who stole it from them because they can't get help elsewhere. So there are problems again with this. But it is generally a good rule, but I don't fully agree with it. This is the only one where I got that way. Thou shalt not, okay, commandment nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. In the Old Testament, neighbor referred exclusively to Hebrew kin. So it's not really what they think it is. But let's just say we're talking about other neighbors aside from just Hebrew kin. It's still problematic because it's absolute. For example, if lying is being used to protect a person, in your neighborhood, such as saying they're not here in the in Nazi Germany, where people were hiding Jewish people in their homes uh, from the uh, from the Nazi regime. So they're going to lie and say they aren't there when they are, or lie about who they are, because they're able to pass for a German when they're actually not. The tenth commandment: Thou shalt not covet covet thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is thy name belongs to thy neighbor. So everything there is property. This limits freedom of thought and opinion. 
Coveting is also important because it's a significant progenitor of progress when in the form of aspiration. This is a curious list because it seems to imply that wives and servants are a neighbor's property. And I'll just quickly point out that the Ten Commandments seems to be missing uh, uh, an objection to human slavery and, uh, uh, talk, uh, and treating women unequally. Women are not property. Women are people just as much as men are. And men, I think, should aspire to be equal to women. Thank you very much. Eddie, Eddie, got to take yourself off mute. Forgot I was muted. That's yeah. <laughs> Living in a house full of females, you learn to just mute yourself sometimes. <laughs> uh, that's uh, probably part of the origins of uh, hashtag mute Oz. That's um, right. <laughs> your, yeah, your wife and daughter started it. <laughs> Dude, shut up. <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> so, uh, so round one opening. How'd you feel like that went, Eddie? Oh, it's pretty, um, pretty in depth. I mean, I thought it was pretty, uh, pretty well done by both of them. So. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, they both did their their homework, and really at the end of the the opening statements, I don't have a lot to say because that's really just each person laying out their argument, you know. And uh, <clears throat> now the uh, the cross uh, the cross um, the cross section, and then when we get to the open uh, the open dialogue is when uh, when it starts getting juicy, yeah, uh, juicy. That's how the so starts. Yep. So uh, real quick, just in the chat, uh, everybody that's here hanging out with us, I saw a lot of new names in there. Thank you very much for checking out the Atheist Roundtable. Uh, and uh, we we try to get at least one or two debates uh, a week or every two weeks. You know, um, we're having more and more requests come in. So uh, we'll keep you guys up to date as uh, as they come in. But let's uh, uh, let's let's get them back on here and uh, let's let's get down to business. All right. Uh, so this is going to be the cross-examination section. I think, Gavin, you're going first. One thing that I just want to make sure we point out, um, Gavin, I think because uh, Randolph's audio is a little sensitive, I'm not sure how else to say it, uh, y y if he's not muted, it tends to drown out uh, what you say, Gavin. So you just try to speak up as much as you can. Um, speak louder. Uh, yeah, if, if you just... Just because it seems like Randolph, your your mic is kind of sensitive. Oh, okay. Ah, I thought it was okay earlier. I can stay muted when until I talk. That's fine. All right. So, Gavin, this is your ten minutes to uh, to cross examine Randolph. So, have at it. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Doctor Josh. Thanks, Randolph. Good opening. So, what I want to do. Straight away, I'm going to try and steal man what Randolph was saying. I think this is fair because then it, it, it makes it seem like we're both on the same page. So from what I could get from what Randolph was saying, um, and Randolph, you can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed to me you were saying something along the lines of legal systems develop independent of religion. Legal systems need to change with the needs of the people. Um, and you went through the Ten Commandments um, and you were saying that uh, you shall have no other gods but me is not a good commandment because it takes away, I think you said, uh, human freedom. Um, Which commandment was that again? Oh, cut out for me. The first one, you shall have no other gods before me. Religious liberty. So that, in, in your view, cuts out religious liberty. Well, it does cut out religious liberty. So, yeah, I stated that fact. Right. Well, if you're a Christian, it doesn't cut out any religious liberty. So the other one, the other objection you had was... I agree. Um, God said, uh, don't, make, don't worship any other graven images but me. Again, cutting out religious liberty. Uh, no, this would be freedom of expression that that one is limiting. Right. Freedom of expression. Okay. 
But again, too, you know, for the Christian, that's that's not a big deal. Um, we can talk about that later. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. So you also talked about um, God saying he was a jealous God, and you thought that was very, very unfair. And you thought that uh, the jealousy that God was expressing um, was not uh, commiserate with a fair God, a just God, and that would color uh, God's judgment. Um, this is kind of what I was getting. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you also said um, that. Yeah, it's, way go, way go. yeah I, I, uh, I didn't say that it's uh, a problem for God to be jealous, but I said it's a problem for a proper justice system to have jealousy in the mix. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Problem for proper justice system. Okay. And also, um, you, I think, I th see, oh, see, see, here's the problem with trying to steal man somebody. You're writing flat out, trying to keep up with what they're saying. Um, and you also mentioned, I think you mentioned, you thought that the Ten Commandments were unethical. Yeah, it, uh, the, uh, uh, the commandments that I specified are unethical, yes. I, I, right. I didn't state all of them are like uh, the the one about uh, thou shall not steal or commit theft. Um, sure. I don't really have too much of a problem. I don't fully object to that one. I only partially object because I do think yeah. it's generally a good rule. I don't think it should be a law to sure. okay. that extreme for absolutely everything. It needs to be uh, situational. Yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned also too about uh, the commandment for children to... Uh, obey and respect their parents, and you mentioned that some parents are abusive and not worth honouring. And look, I, I, I totally agree with you. However, um, those kinds of parents, they are the exception, they're not the norm. So I would take issue with an objection to that. Now, you also talked about the commandment, thou shall not kill. That's not actually true. The commandment is you shall not murder or thou shall not murder. So you've got the word um, kill there instead of murder. So I don't think anyone would, would take issue with the commandment you shall not murder. I got that word from the Bible, so take it up with the authors of the Bible is what I say to that. Well, no, I say that the Bi most Bibles will say you shall not murder. It's very, very clear. So... Now, another thing you, 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 which kind of stunned me a bit, you objected to, to you shall not commit adultery, and you said that this is, again, restricting human liberty, uh, particularly in the, in the terms of, like, open marriages. I, I, I'm quite dumbstruck with that kind of thing. Um, well, you're understanding my position anyway. Yeah, well, that's what I want to do. I want to steal, uh, steal man it. Um, the... the um, Command not to steal. Um, you'll have to refresh me on the reason why you thought that was not good. Sorry, which one? Don't steal. Don't don't be a thief. You know, don't don't steal from someone. Yeah. So I think that this one needs to take into consideration the situation. Um, and one situation I present is that uh, perhaps somebody steals your tools, and I'm just throwing like woodworking tools, for example, and then you see them there, you know the person who's stolen them, so you steal them back. So do we charge both people with theft? The original owner has a right to take them back, but they have to go on somebody's property to get them. So, of course, this is where a judge needs to deliberate and figure out what's going on. There's also the case of people who are starving that I didn't mention, uh, young children starving and stealing a loaf of bread. Now, of course, there is a problem with the theft there, uh, however, um, the situation uh, warrants a solution that's different than um, something extreme and uh, needs to take into consideration uh, the, all the different aspects. So, uh, thou shalt not steal, I think, is not a black and white legal issue. I think it's one that has to consider the scenario. And the impression I get from the Ten Commandments is that it's just a black and white authoritarian order. Okay. So the next one was uh, bearing false witness to neighbours. Essentially, that's saying don't lie. And it mentions neighbours. 
Sorry? It mentions but, neighbors. It does mention neighbors. Yeah, Jesus Christ was very clear about what the word neighbor meant. It means every other human on the planet. My understanding so, from religious scholars and whatnot is that it, it was in the Hebrew text referring to uh, other Hebrews only. Well... I would um, I would uh, talk to a few other uh, uh, biblical scholars about. I that. did provide an example that applies to any neighbors, though, too. Like I said, any neighbors means every other human being. Um, now, the last thing I've, I've written down. This might be wrong, so correct me if I'm wrong. You took issue with the fact that the last commandment is, "You shall not covet anything of your neighbor." because that limits our human freedom. I might have got that wrong, so correct me if I'm wrong. It limits our freedom of thought and our freedom of opinion right off the bat. Okay. Because we can desire and covet things without acting on those desires. But that commandment is telling us not to do that. It is limiting our thoughts and our opinions. So... So the last commandment um, to you limits our freedom of thoughts, actions, and opinions. Would that be right? That's for the ninth commandment. The not sorry. Uh, sorry, no, that's the do not covet one. Uh, which one yeah, is that? The last one, the last one. The yeah, tenth the, one. the tenth commandment, sorry. Yeah, yeah. limits yeah. freedom yeah. of thought. And, yeah, and, I, and I, I, I suggested that coveting is also a significant progenitor of progress. Uh, when in form of aspiration. Okay, so... There's also some problems so, with this, referring to wives as property and stuff like that. So the last the last commandment you have a problem with because um, to you it limits our thought, actions, and opinions. Is that pretty close? No, it limits our thoughts and opinions. I didn't say Not it limits our, our actions. Not our actions? Okay, just limits our thoughts and actions. No, I had mentioned actions, but uh, not as one of the things that's limited. It limits our thoughts and limits our opinions. Okay. I'm uh, okay with Gavin having an extra minute because I did talk a bit long. He can take it out of my time. No, no, I'm done. I'm finished. Okay. I How really enjoyed that. Nope. That was, I think that was that? Really, uh, nine minutes. It's really good. Okay. Great. And I was willing to give him some more time because I know I talked a bit there. <laughs> No, it's fine. It's fine, uh, Randolph. I just wanted to make right. sure I, I was still, still manning your position correctly. Yep. So you had stated that uh, the Ten Commandments are true and moral, and I've given examples of how they are not. So I guess that's what we're going to be getting into. Um, you had uh, credited uh, the commandments for universal human rights. You credit it for ending slavery. You credit them for creating democracy, um, and uh, you claimed that they are all that are necessary to develop a world that is true and healthy. Uh, you stated that with the Ten Commandments, there would be no need for armies, police, etc., and people would be free to walk late at night without being attacked and uh, sexually assaulted and, and whatnot. Am I understanding that correctly? Um, there would, I said there would be little need for armies, police, or weapons. Oh, little need. Uh, so. Yeah, little need, little need. I didn't say there would be no need. I said... Okay. Um, yep, yep, pretty much. Yeah. All right. So that demonstrates that they are not perfect. But you're not claiming perfection. You said that the Ten Commandments promote the traditional family unit of one man and one woman. Is that correct? Yes. How do well, they do well, that? Well, well, sorry. Well, when I say traditional family unit, I mean one husband, one wife, and children. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah, exactly. But I mean, I'm very curious to know, I'd like to examine this later, how uh, you come to that conclusion that the Ten Commandments do that, because uh, <laughs> I, I'm not connecting the dots there. I'll need your help on that. Um, sure. you, pre you predicated on the belief that they were uh, given a celestial... Okay. Uh, yeah, you said... Um, oh, hang on here. Um, 
I'm just going through a couple of notes here. Uh, sure, here. Thanks, yeah. Um, so you're saying that um, people need a God to tell us what's moral because why we, we wouldn't know without God. Um, and you're wondering how people know these actions are wrong and that we can't know them without God. I think that this is a major insult, but we can get into that later. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, you're saying that atheists reject the idea that God isn't needed to tell people what's wrong. And I'm wondering what happened before religion. Sure. Yeah. Um, you stated that atheism is an ideology. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. It's not an ideology. It's a classification of not believing in deities. Uh, there is nothing in atheism that's anything more than that. That's all it is. Now, there are some atheists who do uh, have certain ideologies, and uh, that that can be problematic. And there are atheists with other ide ideologies that aren't. But there is no inherent ideology for atheism. Atheism is just free and clear. Just a non-belief in deities. That's all it is. You stated that we can do no wrong, that we believe that we can do no wrong because we think no one is watching. Am I understanding that correctly? Yep. Okay. And I would like to get um, to the heart of that at some point um, because uh, I have an objection to that. I, I find it strange that there's an all-powerful celestial spy who sits back and allows everything to happen. So thank you very much. That's That con concludes my cross-examination. Eddie, Eddie, is you ready? Yeah, yeah, I just <laughs> on the uh, content there. Um. Uh, what had happened was, see, uh, what had happened was, <laughs> in case you didn't know, uh, this is a new uh, form of tart live debate night. I like this one. So <laughs> I can get down with this one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But uh, okay, so we have the uh, cross examination, um, and I, I I'll use examination loosely there. Uh, but <laughs> cross examination, um, how'd you feel that went, Eddie? Oh, that was pretty good, man. I like how how cordial and informative it is. You know, sometimes you like to see people duke it out, but sometimes it's good to, you know, just have that that bit of civility, little humanness. So. Yeah, and uh, so far, and for those who don't know, um, I think it's cool for. Uh, uh, for this debate, because normally we have two atheists, uh, you know, hosting it. Uh, but Eddie is a uh, Eddie is a Christian, um, so we, you know, we have both uh, both sides of the argument here. On you know, when we uh, kind of analyze here, but so far it, it's still uh, still going back to um, a, a God. Yeah, a God is you know. Um, so I'm <clears throat> I'm really excited to get into the uh, the open discussion and see if we can start breaking down why why they are or are not moral. Now that we've got through through the, yeah. uh, the the groundwork there. So again, everybody in the chat, uh, thanks for your participation and hanging out with us tonight. You guys have been amazing in the chat. Uh, and uh, I'm, work I'm working on the one thing. I'm working on the one thing and we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do, but uh, let's get, uh, let's get these, uh, get these gentlemen back on here and uh, they'll have 40 minutes of open discussion. Let's get it. You can go All ahead right. and ask first if you like, Gavin. Sure. Okay. So the first, I'd like to ask you, Randolph, where do you um, get your sense of uh, absolute morality, truth, and logic from? I don't believe it's necessary, first of all, to have an absolute sense of those things. Um, and I certainly don't. Uh, my my feeling on uh, morality and ethics is that they're kind of situational, they're, uh, uh, they're subjective, and uh, to have something that's objective would mean that it would have to be independent of a mind. Uh, so um, 
the fact that uh, photons travel at a particular speed that's expressed in physics of the letter C is, is a fact that is independent, that is objective. It is independent of a mind. But morals and ethics are dependent on minds. So that, uh, first of all, I, I'm, I have to... Um, I have to reject the necessity aspect of that. So the other um, that you're asking about, uh, the other aspect of your question I'll answer is where I get them from is from uh, my own personal standard. And, and people have different approaches that they use, but but mine includes uh, trying to consider what uh, what the situation would be like for the person for other people. Uh, particularly those affected by my decisions. And when it comes to making laws, um, I have tremendous respect and, and greatly value uh, John Rawls, R-A-W-L-S, work in his publication, Theory of Justice, um, uh, in specifically the, uh, the concept of the veil of ignorance, uh, which is a very important thing in lawmaking because it considers, the idea is for the lawmaker to consider uh, what happens with all the different roles in society. So the, the way the mental exercise works is that you're, say you're the lawmaker drafting up the legislation and you need to think about the possibility that you could be thrown into society in any role, in any walk of life, um, with any kind of disability or sickness. Uh, you could be either sex, you could have uh, any kind of sexual orientation, you could be any race. You may be bald, you may be, have a particular hair color that's a bit strange. It could be all kinds of different things. And um, the more that you can consider, the more equal that you can make that law for everyone. And that's the idea behind it. And I, I think that, that um, I use that as best as I can in trying to determine if my own decisions and assessments of morality are, are probably on the right track. And I say probably because I never know for certain, but, but I, I do my best. So just to be clear, your your standard of morality is your own personal standard. Is that right? Partly, yes. And also I consider what other people's uh, standards are in society because I want to get along well with other people in society and, and have a good life. And I want others to have a good life, too. So, of course, um, we also have a legal system which provides some guidance in these areas as well. Yeah, so I'm talking about your own personal, own personal standards of morality. So, there, would you concede that there would be some some uh, subjectiveness to your own personal standards? I just said that there is that they are subjective. Okay, well, that's a big problem. That's a major problem, and the reason is this: if you really believe that your moral standard is subjective. Um, then you then you hold to what's known um, as a meta-ethical position called moral non-cognitivism, and moral non-cognitivism says that there are no moral truths or falsities. You can Google it. So if you're a moral cog moral non-cognitivist, which you will be ran off because you've just admitted that your own personal standard is subjective, you will hold the position that Hitler and the Holocaust was neither immoral. Or moral. This is a delusional meta-ethical position to hold because a non-cognitive denies the cognitive's claim that moral judgments are capable of being objectively true. I, that does not describe me accurately and your assumption about my views on uh, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime are uh, basically a straw man. I call it out as a straw man argument attempt. It's attempted because I've identified it and I'm refusing it. Um, the, uh, uh, the same argument could be made for your God because your God has put these rules forward and um, I consider them subjective as well. I'm not aware of anything any kind of moral standard that could be considered objective. The farthest I could go with it is if you and I were to agree that um, it's that that something is wrong, like like stealing somebody's bicycle, um, for example. Uh, then, if we agree on this principle, which I suspect we both do, um, that uh, we could make objective, or say I should say, non-subjective, would be a better word to use. 
a non-subjective assessment on whether somebody else stealing that bicycle is making a moral action, uh, is committed a moral action or an immoral action. We, we could do that, but we have to agree on things uh, first before we can do that. I hope everything's okay for you there. Yeah, no, it's fine. It's do you fine. need a minute? No, 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 I'm okay. I'm okay. okay. Right. So um, I'm going to hold... I'm going to but hold I'm, your feet. To, I'm going to hold your feet okay. to the fire about sure. um, having objective morals. Um, you can Google this. You can Google what moral non-cognitivism is. And anybody that holds subjective morality, they are a moral non-cognitivist. So Google that while you've got a chance. Well, the description so the other, that you the description that you put forward to it does not describe me. I already stated that. So because you provided a, a description of it and I rejected it, I think that's already sufficient there. Well, you can reject it all you like, but the fact is you claim that your own moral standards are subjective. So by yes. that very definition, by that very definition, if you really believe that your morality is subjective, then you hold to a meta-ethical position known as moral non-cognitivism. This is common knowledge. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna come in for just a second, guys. Um, I have a question, actually, so go ahead. I'm, I'm I'm absolutely fine, obviously, with you know uh, people obviously talking about morality and, but because the focus of this is supposed to be on the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> I'm fine with talking about subjectivity and objectivity, and you know how how for example how can Randolph say it's okay to steal or it's not okay to steal? You know, but let's tie it back to the Ten Commandments if we can. Okay. Yeah, I had a quick question. I was just hoping to get an example of uh, some kind of thing that is a morality that is objective, that is non-subjective, that is objective, that is independent of mind. Do you, do you want me to give you an example of... Oh, yeah, I wasn't asking Dr. Josh. So you're asking me what? What are you asking me, sorry? Can you provide an example of an objective moral? You shall not murder. So, um, murder what? You have to be more specific. You shall not murder another human being. Okay. And from the perspective of an alien species that's much more powerful and stronger than us, um, it's okay to murder us. Or let's say um, a deity. A deity wants to globally flood the planet and murder and kill off all these people. That's wow. uh, that's moral. Wow, you're really you're really struggling. If you have to bring in aliens, you asked me for an objective morality, and I gave you one. You yeah. shall not murder. Do you want another one? But I I basically asked those questions to point out the problem with calling it objective. And the thing is, in order for it to be objective, it has to be independent of mind. It has to apply universally. Otherwise, it's not objective. Well, you shall not murder is independent of human mind, is it not? It's a divine command. Um, I don't think that it's independent of mind. It requires people to observe it and agree with it. That's your subjective opinion. I've already told you what's wrong with your subjective opinions. Yes, it is. And your opinion is just as subjective as mine. No, no, I don't think so. Okay. Oh, you've we got God on your side, this, right? We can settle this really easily. We can settle this really easily. Okay. How do you, how do you, what tools do you use at your disposal to arrive at um, absolute truth and absolute logic? Absolute truth and absolute logic. Um, I've never made the claim that I have absolute truth or that I know absolute logic. Um, I, I try to understand these things as best I can. Okay, so I'm instead of dodging, absolutist. okay, instead of dodging, how about just no, giving I, me an no, answer? No, 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 I'm not an absolutist. An answer? How about I'm giving an me an answer? How about giving me an answer to how do you arrive at truth and logic? What process do you use? Well, the the process of skepticism is is very useful tool for this. I take doubt as my ally. 
I try to do the best I possibly can to understand all variables, but I don't know what all the variables are. So I can only work with what I have available to me. Okay, there's too much dodging going on here. I want to know from you what human tools you use to arrive at truth and logic. Well, for truth, we try to, uh, to validate things by, uh, depending on what it is, um, we need to, uh, like if it's, if somebody says you combine these chemicals and you will get a certain reaction, then we can test that um, by getting a hold of those chemicals and seeing and observing whether or not the same reaction occurs. But when it comes to something else, like somebody uh, is accusing someone else of committing a crime, then there's different evidence that's needed. So again, it, it really depends on the situation. What you're asking is a very broad question um, that I don't have one specific answer for. Um, you, you're dodging more than OJ Simpson, Rudolph. Randolph, this is not sorry. dodge. I'm I'll trying to give again. you a straightforward I'll answer here. I'll say it again. I'll say it again. It's really clear and it's okay, really Okay, well, well not, ha ha hang, hang on, hang on. Sorry. I, I, again, getting to issues of like epistemology or how do we know things. I mean, again, I think those are good things and they can tie in here. I'm just, I'm not seeing how it's tying in. Mm -hmm. So maybe... I just because it's got to come back to the Ten Commandments, right? So, I mean, if we want to take one thing and we want to say, all right, let's talk about how do you know it's sorry, I don't want to give everybody their what to say or whatever, but you know, well, why is it wrong to steal or why is it wrong to then we can do that, but well, let's, let's try to keep it to the Ten Commandments, please. Yeah, um, the problem we've got, Dr. Josh, is that I'm trying to. to I'm trying to get Randolph to tell me how he arrives at truth and logic and then we can move into the ten commandments because i need to know how he arrives at truth and logic once we know that then we can get into the ten commandments well what do you mean by arrive at logic i've already explained with the uh, with truth there's it, it has to be evidence-based generally but different scenarios can require different uh, uh, different kinds of evidence but okay. uh, or different well, processes. Have to say it again. i have to say it again how do you randolph as an individual how do you arrive at truth and logic? What do you use? What physical means do you use to arrive at truth and logic? Oh, you're attempting to limit the scope of my options here, but it's not always uh, arriving at truth is not always by physical means. Sometimes it is by using logic. Sometimes it's by, by doing other things. So it really depends on what specific truth that we're, we're dealing with. So you're asking me a very broad question and expecting a very specific answer that can apply in a black and white way to everything. And I can't provide you with that kind of answer. Because you're dodging. No. I'm just wanting an answer, an answer. But you're not, you're not willing to give me an answer, so you're dodging. So anyway, let's move on to the Ten Commandments, shall we? Because this I is disagree. going to be no good. Mm -hmm. You can disagree with a lot, but I've asked you a fairly straightforward question, which you refuse to answer because you're dodging it. So let's move on to these Ten Commandments and what you don't agree with. Do you want to talk about the first one? What you don't agree with the first one? The First Commandment? Okay, yep. so the, the problem with the First Commandment is that it limits religious liberty. And you did state that that's not a problem for a Christian because it limits. And, and that I agree with you on that part because uh, the, uh, a person who is a Christian, of course, is not going to have a problem being a Christian under that Christian commandment. People who want to be part of a different religion with different deity or deities will be restricted if they have to adhere to that commandment. Uh, or a Christian who wants to switch to a different um, religion will then actually be restricted by that first commandment. Yeah, you do understand that the Ten Commandments, they're not legal laws, they're just moral, moral rules, right? You understand that? So how is that moral? You should have no other gods but me. How is that moral? How is it moral to restrict somebody's freedom, uh, their liberty of religion, their freedom of religion? Because there is only one true God. According to who? According to the scriptures, according to general revelation, according to personal re revelation, and according to a huge number of scholars, 
across the planet. But here's the thing. That's a question that could be a whole other debate, right? Well you, just, well, you just you just made a claim about it. You you said that that's a fact that there's only one deity, and then that somehow justifies the first commandment. If it was a fact that there is that only that one deity, then there would be no need for that first commandment. So, shall we uh, uh, eradicate the first commandment? No. Oh, no. so you you're you you lack some confidence in there being only one deity? No, that's a. Uh... That's a silly thing to say. I lack confidence um, in the judgment of mere mortals, in the judgment of men. Yeah, so, but, if but if you say there's only one deity and that, that deity issued these Ten Commandments and the commandment is saying thou shalt not worship any other deities, that's a useless commandment. Why? Why? Why is it useless? It's redundant if, if that's why? the only deity. But men... Make up other man-made deities, don't they? Oh, it's not talking about man-made deities. It's just talking about other deities. Wow. Which seems to contradict your claim that that's the only deity. Wow. Well, you're making this so difficult and so overcomplicated. God is saying, you shall not worship any other deities but me. Because men are fallible. And men make up other deities that they worship. Are you assuming that your God is? Are you assuming that your God is infallible? Absolutely, absolutely. Then why flood the world if uh, if he's infallible? He should have made everybody perfect and not have a need that to flood the world. Topic, that is a topic for another debate, and we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. We're going to. Okay, I won't accuse you of dodging, but we can move on to the next commandment if you like. Don't accuse me of dodging when you can't even answer a straight question. I told you, I'm not accusing you of dodging. I said I won't accuse you of dodging. So so you let's just, we can just go so ahead and move on to the next so question. If you explain, so can you explain your comments about legal systems need to change with the needs of the people? I'd like to, like to sort of find oh, out. Oh, yeah. I can give there. you an example of that. We have um, cool. computer systems were introduced and uh, at one point in our society. And then uh, computers were used to collect private information about people. So new laws had to be created to protect people's privacy uh, on uh, their uh, uh, privacy of the, that is on these computer systems because it worked differently than paper forms that were used previously. So yes, the, the laws need to change. Sometimes uh, the speed limits uh, on streets need to be changed because people are more comfortable driving a bit faster or a bit slower and so there can be different reasons for that or somebody may petition the government to change the laws because they see a problem uh, with the current laws that needs to be addressed so yeah this is this is just a common thing that happens and uh, from what I see with the Ten Commandments is they haven't changed for over 2,000 years 3,000 years oh okay uh, I can accept 3,000 I'm okay with that so what, what, what about the needs to change, in your opinion? In the Ten Commandments? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think uh, that, uh, uh, I think annihilating the first one, uh, removing it, uh, would be a very good first step, um, because uh, that way people's religious freedom will no longer be limited. The religious freedom to worship false gods. Okay, um, what's your objection to that? What's my objection to people just freedom, freedom to worship false gods? Yeah, what's your objection the, to that? The Bible is replete. The Bible is replete of what happens to people when they worship false gods. Sorry, what happens? The Bible is replete. Replete means uh, many examples. It's oh, I, I know. Full of examples of what happens to people when they worship when they worship false gods. Oh, what happens? Uh, nothing good. Nothing good happens to them. Nothing good happens to them. Hmm. Yeah, the prophets of Baal. When Elijah uh, challenged the prophets of Baal, um, all the prophets uh, ended up with, I think, getting their heads chopped off. Something like that. Yeah. 
So anyway, what else? What else has to change? Sounds what like food is a moral monster. Okay. So well, that's basically, your, that's, that's your subjective opinion again. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, Which then, and because it's a subjective opinion, it degrades to moral non-cognitivism, where there are no moral truths or falsities. And that well, is a delusional medical ethical position to hold. I will keep, keep hammering that, this whole debate. So, so what else? What else needs to change um, to the needs of the people? So I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, believing in a, in a false deity is necessarily going to lead to bad things, going to lead to a person's head getting chopped off or things like that. Um, if that's happening, who's making that happen? It's people from other religions, typically. It's, as far as I know, it's not the God doing that, because the God doesn't murder people because one of his own commandments says not to kill people, right? One of his own commandments says, thou shall not murder. Yeah. And if somebody is worshipping a false God, in his view, and let's say he kills them, would that qualify as murder? If he kills them for worshipping another deity? So you're asking me a question that only God would know. Um, that's not a wise thing to do because I'm not God. I don't have the mind of God. Okay. So then how do you know that God actually issued all these commandments and it wasn't the people who were inspired by God to write them incorrectly? Well, <laughs> man, you're really struggling. No, um, I'm not. I'm asking you a question. Yeah, I'm trying to are. understand. Yeah, you are. You are. Um, no. Every every word in the text, every word in the biblical text is inspired by God. God used human authors to write down his word. That is a fact that is well as well accepted on the planet. It seems to be well accepted by everybody except atheists. So what else in the Ten Commandments do you think needs to change with the needs of the people? Well, uh, people need freedom. So uh, number two uh, should be abolished, uh, annihilated, removed. Uh, commandment three also limits freedom hold of expression on, and needs to be eliminated. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, we've Sorry. got 20 minutes left. I'm trying to go quickly here. Okay. okay, so what's wrong with number two? People need to have freedom of expression. That's a human right in my view. People do now, have freedom. I, I point out to you that you claimed in your opening statement that the Ten Commandments is the is where human rights were created from. Yep. So one of the human rights is freedom of expression. Yet Commandment Two uh, yep. interferes with the human right of freedom of expression. So we have a contradiction here. No, we don't have a contradiction. There's nothing contradictory about the Bible at all. Um, God made us, created us with free will, right? Okay, but you're with changing the scope will, now. With free will comes freedom. Free, free will must have freedom attached to it. Otherwise, there's no such thing as real, true love. For love to be real, it must have freedom attached to it. It must have that risk of turning your back on God and saying, I don't want anything to do with you. That's the risk that God take, took to give us free will. So we have free will. We have freedom. Well, commandment two says otherwise. It says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or likeness of any things in heaven and above, etc. So yeah. that's a limitation on freedom of expression. Well, it's not a legal law, right? It's not a legal mm. law. No one's going to go to jail because of it. But people have chosen to worship other gods or worship other idols or turn their mm. backs on God then why does God follow up that second commandment by saying that uh, he is a jealous God? Because he is. Okay, so that sounds like it could be very dangerous for somebody who is making graven images that he doesn't approve of. Could be. Yeah, yeah. could be. That's up to God. That's up to God. So that limits freedom of expression? I don't think so. We have free will, don't we? I certainly think so. Yeah, so do I. I know we do. So well, what commandment, commandment three, I think, needs to go. It limits freedom of expression as well. 
and it uh, prevents, uh, it disallows people to hold God accountable for his wrongdoings. Yeah. Okay. So I think, I think at this stage it's probably good to just get um, a real brief outline of the reasons why the Mosaic Law was introduced. The Mosaic Law was given specifically to the nation of Israel. It was made up of three parts, the Ten Commandments, the Ordinances, and the Worship System, which included the priests of the Tabernacle, the Offerings, and the Festivals. So there's seven bullet points that I'll run through really quickly. The purpose of the Mosaic Law was to accomplish the following. Number one was to reveal the, reveal the holy character of the eternal God to the nation of Israel. Two was to set apart the nation of Israel as distinct from all other nations. Three was to re reveal the sinfulness of man. Number four was to provide forgiveness through the sacrificial offerings for the people who had faith in the Lord in the nation of Israel. Uh, point five it was to provide a way of worship for the community of faith through the yearly feast. Six, provide God's direction for the physical and spiritual health of the nation. Now that's really important, the physical and spiritual health, health of the nation. And the last point for the Mosaic law was to reveal to humanity that no one can keep the law, but everyone falls short of God's standards of holiness. I'm sorry, this I didn't quite understand the last point. Reveal to humanity the what? Re reveal to humanity that no one can keep the law, but everyone falls short of God's standards of holiness. That realization causes us, it causes us to rely on God's mercy and his grace. Because we're in the time of grace now. When Christ came, he fulfilled the law and he paid the death penalty that we were supposed to pay. Christ took the bullet for us in our, in our, in our place. So that's the reason for the Mosaic Law. Oh, and you're talking about vicarious life. redemption. No, no. No, no. You said uh, okay. Jesus took a bullet for everyone by, I guess, being dying on the cross, right? Being crucified and dying on the cross, yeah. Yeah, that's called vicarious redemption. It's unethical. No, <laughs> it's not. Yeah, it it's is. Not if you're God. It's not if you're God. Um, so if somebody is... stood in for Charles Manson so that he could get out of jail and decide to go to jail in his place, would you consider that to be ethical then? No, that's a silly comparison. Because... No, it's not. It's a direct well, comparison. No, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I um, think vicarious redemption is ridiculous. I think I think your understanding. Okay, let me ask you this: What do you think is the main theme, the central theme, the core theme of the entire Bible, from the opening uh, verses in Genesis to the closing verses in Revelation? What do you think the main theme of the Bible is? The main theme word? of the Bible. Oh, yeah, the central theme. The central theme. I, I, as much as I do think that like a theological discussion of that sort would be useful, unless it ties specifically back to the Ten Commandments, I like this is interesting and I want to hear it, but it does. Uh, too it much. Does okay, Josh. all right, I'll let it. I'll let it roll. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I don't think there's just one theme, and it seems to be multi-themed. So I couldn't sorry. pick one. You couldn't pick one. Okay. Unless I, I guess it is to try to convince people to follow God's orders. I suppose I, I'm not sure. There, there, there's so many themes in it. That would be an example of one. Uh, do what God says, or you'll be punished. Is is one theme. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that's another one. Another theme right. comes out is that everybody's born in sin. Yeah, Again, yeah, I don't yeah. and like Josh, yeah, yeah, Doctor yeah, Josh yeah, was yeah. just saying. I'm not sure how this relates to yeah, 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 the Ten yeah, Commandments. Yeah. Well, I can tell you. I can tell you how it points to the Ten Commandments because uh, biblical scholars all agree. Even um, even atheist biblical scholars, because there are atheist biblical scholars. Yep, they all there agree. Are. There are. There are. Yeah. The central theme, the entire theme, the main thrust of the entire Bible is spiritual redemption, spiritual reconciliation. Not social mm -hmm. reform. Not social reform. Although... Social reform can be a byproduct of spiritual redemption, redemption, but the main theme of the entire Bible is spiritual redemption back to God. So that's where it 
the Ten Commandments tie in. It's the main thrust of the, of the entire Bible is the spiritual redemption of mankind back to God. Can you not see? Can you not see how these moral codes will aid men, seriously flawed human beings, of which I am one, and so are you, and so is Dr. Josh. Can you not see how these ten divine moral um, guidelines, because they're not legal codes, these ten divine moral guidelines can assist, can help seriously flawed human beings become spiritually reconciled with God. No, because I don't know the mind of God, and you said you don't know the mind of God early, so uh, I don't think you know this either. Wow. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Well, here's the thing. This is where Christians have always got the wood on, um, on atheists. Um, the way... I see a lot of limitations in the Ten Commandments. A lot of arbitrary that's, limitations. That's, that's your subjective opinion. It's only the problem is, opinion. many Christians claim that it is the guide to morality and the whole world should run on it. Many Christians claim that they are great moral laws. It seems to be only atheists who have an objection to them. No, it's not. I know some Christians who objected as well. And there's people from other religions who also object to it because they've got their own standards usually. Yeah, well, you're probably talking about a tiny substrata of the global population. Uh, um, which denomination yeah. of Christianity uh, are you saying that is promoting this? So here's the problem. Here's the problem that the atheist has compared to the Christian. This is the way, um, this is the way that the majority of uh, Non-Christians arrive at truth and logic. They use their senses and they use their brain to arrive at truth and logic. But there's a problem. There's a problem with that. Um, because the brain can be fallible and the yep. senses can be fallible. Yep. You would agree with that. It's been scientifically proven that the brain can be fallible. Mm -hmm. However, the Christian obtains absolute truth, absolute morality, absolute goodness through the infinite mind of the God of the Bible. So and we have access to infinite truth, absolute morality, absolute goodness. We have access to it. Uh, the people who wrote the Bible who were inspired by God, are you claiming that they were infallible when they wrote it? The word of God is infallible. That's the not answering my question. Infallible. The people who wrote well, the Bible. Well, based of, on... course, of course the people that wrote the Bible were mere mortals, right? They're men and women. Just Sorry, they're men, just like you and I are. So oh, no yes, they're, they're seriously flawed men. But the word of God is inerrant. Inerrant. It's infallible. So if the people who wrote the Bible were flawed men, yep. how do you know that the Bible is the perfect word of God? Because the Bible has been the most uh, investigated, the most poured over, um, the, the, the one book in the entire history of mankind that has been um, objectively and subjectively judged and looked at from every possible angle to find out if it's wrong and it's not well i've just pointed out how the different commandments are wrong they're problematic well, again, again that's your subjective opinion that yep. that um, dissolves into moral non-cognitivism so you're attempting to attack my character by claiming that i'm a moral non-cognitivist but when you define moral co non-cognitivism earlier, I told you that doesn't describe me. Not, I'm not accurate. Attacking, I'm not attacking your character. You said to me that your principles are subjective. So yes. I'm pointing at the obvious. I'm pointing at the obvious. Man, this is, this is common knowledge. I'm pointing at the obvious that subjective morality soon devolves to soon dissolve, dissolves into moral non-cognitivism, which says there's no moral truth or falsities. That is this, a fact. 
this is reality. Everybody seems to be that way. And I haven't met a single person who is objective, fully 100% objective about everything. That so, probably yeah. has a lot to do with the fact that none of us are perfect. Would you agree? There you go. Including yeah. the people who wrote the Bible. Mm, ah, no, the word of God is inerrant. So how did the word of God survive through when people are writing it? Did they write it or didn't they? Okay. <laughs> so, sorry. I, I, I do love these theological questions. I really do. <laughs> and we probably do have to deal with some of them. But I keep trying to wrangle us back in. So can we can we focus back in on at least, you know, you, we started to talk about stealing. We started to talk about, you know, the first, second, third commandments. Maybe let's, maybe Randolph, a way to do this would be, um, Ask some questions. You know, sure. Yeah, or to to say here's again why I think X is you know immoral because I feel like that's the point of the discussion. Okay, so sure, I, I'll I'll pick one here. Um, let's see. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house or wife and servants, etc. Uh, again, I think that this limits freedom of thought and opinion, and uh, other commandments are placing similar kinds of limits on people's freedoms. And so uh, I'm, I don't uh, accept the commandments as having any authority in my life because uh, freedom serves me a lot better than following some rigid system. And I, I find that there's a lot of people in the world who are also uh, enjoying their freedom instead of uh, following these commandments. There's, uh, uh, the problem is that the commandments are, are sorely outdated for today's society and were problematic in, in old fashioned society as well, in my estimation. And uh, I, I really think that uh, from my impression of this is it was an attempt at setting up some early social norms uh, a quasi-legal system um, of sorts, uh, depending on how it's implemented. And uh, uh, it didn't work out. And we know it didn't work, that it failed, because people moved on and developed real legal systems that do have a feedback system in place where you can object to the laws and you can, you can uh, uh, push for change, you can petition the government to change the laws, you can become part of the government who, and become a lawmaker and change those laws for the better, hopefully. Some people don't, and that's why it needs to be an open system. So democracy and all this stuff uh, is not promoted, definitely not promoted by any of these commandments uh, from what I can see. Um, so uh, because these are considered objective and uh, by people who, who like them for whatever reasons. And uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that our society isn't running under these rules. What, prob what, what moral objection do you have to the command, you shall not murder? Okay. Uh, because there are scenarios where killing is helpful, and I'll give you some examples. No, 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 stop. Okay. The question is, what moral objection do you have to the command, you shall not murder? I'm not talking about self-defense. I'm not talking about killing in wartime. I'm talking about murder. What moral objection do you have to, you shall not murder? Well, let's take a look at capital punishment. It is systemic murder. Um, because the people who are put onto death row are slated for execution. Uh, against their will. It's a violation of their bodily autonomy, of their human rights. Um, the, I, I actually don't think this is funny. I think it's very serious. You know that some people are wrong. You, you do realize. You do, you, excuse me. Excuse me. Keep it on this row. I'm, I'm trying to continue to explain here that you do realize. You do realize. Excuse me. You do realize that there are um, instances of people being wrongfully convicted. And the problem with capital punishment in its current form, I'm thinking in the US in particular, but other countries are, are very much the same kind of approach overall, uh, is that there becomes this deadline when they will be put to death. And, and that is a travesty of justice. In fact, I have written a solution about this that um, the uh, it should actually at least, at the very least, just be a life sentence with after a minimum year served 
provide an option for the the convicted person to appeal to a judge uh, to uh, to confirm that they are willing to accept the death penalty. So um, I think that would be a much better approach. So I do think good that dodge. that's good an example dodge. of murder good that's dodge. immoral. Good dodge. This so is not dodge. Dodge. This, No, you, yeah, you don't want to address this. That's the problem. Got, you, you, you're better than O.J. Simpson at dodging. So apart from those who serve in the gloves? army, <laughs> who, kill who kill in self-defense, or who are going to be... Um, under the law of capital punishment, what else? I disagree with the laws of moral? capital punishment. What, I do think they are systemic murder find, and they are immoral. What else do you find? What else do you find immoral about the moral guideline of "you shall not murder"? Sorry. What else what do I find? Why should I have to run out of examples? About the a moral guideline of you shall not murder forgetting well, the problem those, is forget, big, just a minute just a minute I, you just I had started, a minute you're asking me I to think, answer and i'm trying to answer now oh man are you such an oh. atheist okay putting aside self-defense putting aside <laughs> killing and warfare putting aside those who are under capital punishment Tell me what you find immoral about the moral guideline. Do I'm not murder. You I'm shall not murder. I'm not putting those aside, and I'll tell you why. The King James Bible and the Hebrew Bible, uh, the original Hebrew one, specify thou shalt not kill. That's commandment six. It's not thou shalt not murder. It's thou shalt not kill. Murder is a subset of killing. So my examples no, stand, no, and they stand on their no, own merits. No, 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 no. Well, no. go ahead and let's let's take a look at. No, let's take a look. Let's okay. up, let's okay. open up Exodus twenty, King James version of the Bible, and well, go to verse down. number uh, thirteen. It says right there, "Thou shalt not kill." It uses right. the word "kill." Right, we're at, we're at time, and I, I I would love to I would love to hear that go on. Uh, I really would. I'm okay uh, with it. Discussion, but. Uh, yeah, we're at time. Ooh, spicy. Wow, boy. Spicy. What, man? That started to get uh, a little fun there. I thought the pants were going to come off. I mean, gloves were going to come off. <laughs> spicy. Spicy. Oh, so, uh, real, real quick, what, what do you think so far, Eddie? Um, on winner, loser, or just a debate? Yeah, what do you think is going on? Yeah. Um, I think that Gavin has failed significantly in um, the original title of the debate. Uh, I, a lot of issues with Randolph's position, but that's not what this is about. Um, and I, I think Randolph took this one. Yep, and we, you know, we have the the closing statements, and and to be clear, because uh, there are there are a lot of new uh, new names I uh, see in the chat. We <clears throat> um, we're not afraid to, uh, yeah, we are the atheist roundtable. Um, but I think two out of the last three debates we've had uh, come up to this one, we've given the theists the uh, the edge on on the debate, so we're not afraid to uh, call a spade a spade. And really, the way I base it to try to stay as neutral as possible is I base it on yeah. ar argumentation. Who gave the best argument? Doesn't mean I agree with you. Um, on either side, but who gave the the best ar argumentation? Uh, and so far, um, you know, so far I'm not convinced uh, that um, uh, that the t Ten Commandments are you know are the way we need to be. You know, what we need to be following to you know to live a a moral life or you yeah. know an ethical life. Well, you know, whatever word you want to put on there. But uh, as far as presentation, yeah. So so far, I'd, I'd go to the to the atheist side um, on, on this one. So uh, we do have the closing statements left. So let's see uh, let's see what they got in store for us. And one last time, uh, everybody in the chat, thanks for hanging out. I see see my boy Ethan from y N, uh, YFNA is uh, hanging out with us. Good to see him, my man. And up, uh, oh, hold on, everybody, welcome. Titan, your anus your is in the middle. Anus. We got to do at least once a feed. Uh, 
Uh, and then this is the time. So they're going to have uh, five minute closing statements. Uh, this is the time if you want to um, you want to put questions in there. Uh, I know they're going to rattle off fast. So please tag uh, Oz uh, on there so I can see him uh, in uh, the um, super chat is activated. That's the easiest way for me to keep track of it uh, because my ADHD brain sees all the colors. I'm like, oh, cool colors, and, and I can pick those out. So uh, let's get to it, Eddie. And then uh, remember, we'll come back to this with the Q&A. So uh, go ahead and start uh, uh, stacking those up there, and uh, we'll, we'll see you all in a minute. All right, uh, Gavin, you started. So uh, I think we, we let you go first. Sure. Closing. Okay. This is this is closing statement, right, Dr. Josh? Yes, sir. Okay, so I think I successfully pointed out um, that my opponent's uh, position is one of moral non-cognitivism. My opponent admitted that uh, he sets his own standards um, that are purely subjective. Now, if somebody's moral standards are purely subjective then they quickly dis dissolve into moral non-cognitism, which says that there is no moral truth or falsity. Now, if you're a moral non-cognitive, you will hold a position, something like Hitler and the Holocaust was neither immoral or moral, but this is a delusional meta-ethical position to hold because a non-cognitivist denies the cognitive claim that moral judgments are capable of being objectively true this is common knowledge this is not rocket science um, the atheist uh, uses information gained by his senses and his brain to arrive at uh, truth and logic but here's the problem uh, neuroscience has proven that the brain can be fallible and the senses can be fallible however the Christian does not just use his or her senses and brain. The Christian uses the word of God, the Bible, the scripture to arrive at absolute truth and absolute logic because we can gain those truths and logics through the infinite mind of God because God is necessary and perfect. God is necessary and perfect. Um I'm pretty much finished. I, it was very difficult for me to get a, a clear answer from my opponent. There was a lot of dodging going on, a lot of dodging. And I would have appreciated uh, much more clearer um, answers than dancing around the head of a pin. So we really didn't, um, we really didn't get into the meat of the, the Ten Commandments, but um, I think my opponent's non-cognitive non-cognitivist position um, hindered us a lot in getting into the meat of the Ten Commandments. And with that, I yield to my learned opponent. Thank you very much, Gavin. Uh, it's never been this heated between us before, and uh, that was uh, kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> dodging. I attempted to answer questions accurately, but they were generally broad, incomplete, and almost hypothetical. Um, as far as moral non-cognitivism goes, yes, I set my own objective standards. That is definitely true. And as far as I know, everybody does. Some people will rely on other sources. Some people will come up with it on their own, or a combination of these things is usually where it goes, where it comes from, in my observation, my understanding. Um, when you mentioned that Adolf Hitler and the Holocaust being neither moral or immoral is where non-cognitivism leads, uh, this is where you have uh, mischaracterized me, because that is not how I think. Um, and I consider that to be an attempt at a straw man, and I say attempt because it failed, and here's how it is trivially defeated in one statement. I oppose what Adolf Hitler did. I think it is immoral, and I think it is wrong, and that is my subjective opinion, and I stand by it. Um, you did correctly state that human brains are not perfect and are infallible. I say, yes, that is correct, and it also applies to the author of the Bible, which justifies doubting the veracity of the claim that it is the perfect word of God. 
So I will leave people with one thing to think about. Um, instead of Ten Commandments, uh, a general guideline that I live by is how to live well. One is there's four areas in our life that we need. One is that we need to get sleep for recovery and rejuvenation. Number two is we need to have family and friends. We need relationships. Number three, we need work, education, and or volunteering. And uh, uh, that would be a productive activity. And then number four, we need hobbies and exercise, fun activities. And it's pretty wide open and straightforward. And I believe that if people have all four of these things in their life, they live a, a very well-balanced life. Now, I understand that not everyone's going to do that. And the most important underlying thing about being a human being is that inherently and implicitly, we are free to think what we want, to form our own opinions, and we should definitely be free to express ourselves in any way we please. And unfortunately, the Ten Commandments place a lot of limitations on these things. So that is why I reject the Ten Commandments overall, and I did give specific reasons. Thank you very much. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for another great debate, and <clears throat> we will get to Q&A uh, here in a second. And um, I apologize. I I had a little spill here right before we <laughs> I'm trying to clean up so it doesn't get all my stuff here. Um, <clears throat> but we'll, we'll jump in there and uh, real quick, if I can, just to plug it one last time here, uh, pull this up. Uh, this PayPal uh, down here at the bottom, what that's for is uh, for those who don't know Jenna Belk, uh, she's one of the co-hosts on the Atheist Experience. She is getting ready to have a little baby, a uh, little baby Belk. And we're, we're running a raffle to to help her with you know whether it's diapers, clothes, cribs, that kind of thing, and uh, you, you go there and uh, we're doing uh, ten dollar minimum uh, you know entries or donations uh, to that, and ten percent of what we uh, what we collect will go to the winner of the raffle. Uh, and yes, I'll tell you how to win here in a minute, uh, and the rest of it will go to uh, the Belk family to help them. So uh, what you do is if you go to that link, uh, you do ten dollars or you, you can give more, but ten dollar minimum. And uh, you pick in the notes, put uh, the date that you think Baby Belk is coming. And uh, her due date is the first week of uh, July. And whoever hits it uh, gets the uh, gets the prize. And any uh, if we happen to have a tie, uh, this is the the uh, kind of fun part. Uh, you know, the, or the, the from the tart uh, perspective, the dumb part is you have to guess uh, Murder Shed Steve's weight. Uh, so not the baby's weight, but Murder Shed Steve's weight. Um, uh, <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll do the axe. Hey, Gavin, have a seat, bud. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cause, is that with or without the axe? Uh, we'll go without because we don't we, we don't know if we bought a standard axe or is it you know um, that's a cool uh, hundred and twenty pounds. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, man, how, how did I do that right before we? I had to go live, uh, or I had to go back on live. Um, all right, so let's get to questions. Let me see who's uh, who's tagged me on here. All right. Um, thank oh. you, Atheist Cats. Five dollars super chat. Um, what good is a commandment if the punishment is avoided by uh, being sorry and worshiping the right God? And uh, Gavin, I would assume that was to you. What good is the commandment if someone says sorry and wishes worships the right God? Uh, what what good is a commandment if the punishment is avoided by being sorry and worshiping the right God? Well, there's nothing wrong with the commandment. It's a good commandment. No, you're saying what uh, what good is a commandment? So, what what good is it to have that kind of a commandment? Yeah, well, the way they've catched the, the way they've uh, couched the question is is pretty word salady. Uh, can you can you make it clear for me, Oz? Um, I mean, I think from a theological standpoint, the question is, if if God is giving commandments, and uh, you, one can avoid the punishment of not murdering, for example, uh, if they repent and worship the right God, you know, worship the deity, to avoid that punishment, <clears throat> what good is the commandment? I think is the question. Right. Well, the commandment is there um, as a hedge against committing 
uh, the crime or committing the immoral act. Okay. Um, give me one second. I'm looking for the uh, – <clears throat> there's one I saw here. I was trying to find it. Um, you spilled something, and I shut my stuff down. So there we are. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're on a roll, folks. Welcome to the Atheist Roundtable. <laughs> uh, I know there is more. Where'd it go? Um, sorry, I guess I had it pulled up here and um, I was tagging some and another gone. I, I did see a comment from Simply Secular, which is quite humorous. Uh, it says, Axe Free Steve, I don't want to live in such a world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where do, uh, oh, okay, here we go. Oh, that's the same one I just asked. Never mind. Um, maybe if you had a question and you tie, you put it up, you know, maybe type it yeah. again. Yeah, I was about to say you might want to retype it again because, uh, oh, here we go. Um, uh, and I can't pull this up on the screen because uh, the way it is, so I'll just read it. Uh, from Redefine Living, question for atheists Can Gavin take your life and win, or do you? like that commandment and you lose um i value my life so gavin can't take it right now but if i was in a situation that i think warranted it and gavin was the only person who could give me relief such as i wanted to uh, i was suffering from a terminal illness let's say and i know it's only going to get worse and i'm at a point where i don't want to live anymore then uh, i would be okay with uh, someone like gavin or anybody else uh, doing that uh, as long as I have confidence in their competency in doing it. Okay. Uh, Gavin, question. The answer is it's situational. Okay. Uh, Gavin, question for you. Uh, do you think the recent capital, uh, capital event in the U.S. on January 6th is supported by the Ten Commandments or no? <laughs> I live in New Zealand. Is my answer. How would I know? So, so G Gavin, Gavin has no clue. That's the answer. He doesn't live here. <laughs> That's a fair answer. <laughs> we'll let you slide on that one. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I think that might be it. I, th th there's a couple there that I'm not going to, um, just out of respect, I'm not going to read um, out loud. Um yeah, I'm I'm okay with any kind of question, even troll questions. It's uh, in case you're wondering. Yeah. Well, it's it's just out of respect. Uh, it, yeah. There's there's certain boundaries that we won't cross here. So, um, uh, oh, here a couple popped up here. Uh, for um, uh, for Gavin, are there any commandments that address? Nope, I'm not doing that. Um, I should have read that before I did it. Uh, now I'm curious. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I also hope you're well. I'll keep it moving. Um, Oz, Oz yep. killing us with suspense. No, no, I'm not doing it. Uh, all right, that's all now. I'll kind of uh, keep a uh, uh, keep an eye on it here for uh, for a second, but I'll I'll do my rounds and make sure I give you guys uh, the props you deserve. So, uh, one, one more time, uh, Randolph, uh, we've we've had uh, quite a few uh, people hanging out with us and uh, and chilling out with us. So, uh, one more time, plug your uh, plug your stuff. Where can everybody find you? And uh, let's uh, let's hear about it. Okay, well, uh, thank you for including me in this debate on uh, TART, the Atheist Roundtable. It's, uh, it's always wonderful to be here and be a part of this. I, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, my website, uh, personal website, is at www.randolphrichardson.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at www.twitter.com slash Randolph828. And my, uh, I will be co-hosting a show in the near future with uh, Neil, the 604 Atheist, called True North Talk. You can read more about that at www.truenorthtalk.ca. It'll be an atheist call-in program. We'll cover any topic almost except for politics because that's just way too divisive. Just That never makes people happy. <laughs> uh, you can also find out more about the Canadian Atheists at www.canadianatheists.ca. Thank you very much for uh, having me on this program with you. Awesome. Nope. Always, always, uh, always love having you. And uh, uh, Gavin, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just let everybody know, when, when you're ready to go to New Zealand, uh, Gavin <laughs> knows, knows where knows where to send you to get food, and then uh, he'll take you to a, kick, a kickboxing gym. Uh, and 
and kick the shit out of you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add, Gavin? We'll have, we'll have a merry old time. Anything else you'd like to, to add? No, I just want to say thanks so much to, to, to Randolph. Thanks, Oz. Thanks, everybody involved with the, with the debate. Um, I'd love to do another round with Randolph about another topic to do with God and the Bible. Um, thanks so much for running a tight ship and a professional ship and trying it straight down the middle. Um, couldn't ask for anything better. Thank you, nope. Gavin. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and, and we appreciate that. And thank you guys for um, for being well prepared when you came in. I do have a couple of questions here before uh, Dr. Yes. Josh and Eddie plug away here. So, uh, uh, Gavin, if the Bible is an errant, uh, is a beaver, a fish and a bat, a bird? Is a beaver, a fish and a bat, a bird? Don't like, know. Don't know. Think, <laughs> that that sounds like a reference to something in the Bible claiming those things. I've I've heard the latter part of that before. I didn't know that the Bible has a claim of a beaver being a fish. That's uh, but I haven't read the whole Bible. Why not? <laughs> uh, when I was really young, I started looking into it because people told me that I should read it, and I couldn't get very far into Genesis, the beginning of it. Uh, because I just found it, it just it didn't seem like a, a just say it, it, it's boring. It's boring. Just say. Um, yeah, I found <laughs> contradictions, and I I just lost interest and moved on to other things. So it just that's the way hey, it is. Gavin, did you have any comments on the the beavers and the birds and the, no, the stuff? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, uh, Gavin, uh, do you believe in uh, categorical imperative? What does that mean? Kant. What are, the, what are the categorical imperative? That's Categor a, categorical imperative. It's Immanuel Kant's uh, ethical system. So would you shall not murder be an, an, an categor, categorical imper, an, an impediment? From what, I, from what I remember, it is along the lines of um, it's an ethical system that doesn't require God, so it would be more like a normative type of ethics, right? For suffering okay. and wellness and things of that nature, right? Right. Well, the, the difficulty is, um, is that all of us are seriously flawed human beings, so whether we admit it or not, we do need God. Right, and then, I'm not uh, to respond to that. I, I find that insulting as somebody who doesn't believe in deities to for anybody to say that I can't be moral without God. I, I consider that nonsense and I object to it. So I, I just I, I can't accept it because I'm living proof of somebody who's not having problems with the criminal justice system and things like that. I, I'm not going out there causing problems for people, uh, serious problems of any sort. I, I'm advocating for freedom and human rights and things like that. Uh, in my own subjective opinion, I'm doing the best I can to, to live a good life, just as many religious people also do. So when somebody comes along and says that I can't make these decisions well at God, what they're basically saying is that I can't think for myself. And, and that's I take that as an insult and I, I object to it. Okay, fair, fair enough. Um, and then, Gavin, uh, does the commandment worshiping one God interfere with free will? No. Okay, that was easy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a short and straightforward was, answer. I, I think they might be hoping for a why, but <laughs> and, uh, that was pithy. Maybe they'll ask, <laughs> Maybe they'll ask and, another question: Why? <laughs> <laughs> this, I, I almost did, but I actually like it just short like that. It's, it's, oh, it's, it's great. Yeah, I like it. It's badass. Uh, uh, then, uh, Randolph, a question for you. Uh, what, uh, what objective standard do you have for evaluating moral truths? If you do not have one, if you do not have one, doesn't that make you a delusional moral non-cognitive? Oh, they're throwing the word delusional in there now. Uh, actually, there is a, um, there's a, a number of standards, that I guess you could say, a number of ideas that I put together for that. And uh, the, the primary one, and I highly recommend looking into it, is John Rawls, R-A-W-L-S is the name of the author. And he's a, a philosopher who's not like 
a lot of other philosophers, he was very laser focused in his area. Usually philosophers go all over the place and cover a lot of different areas, but he, he was very focused and his reading can be reading. His books can be a bit, they're a bit dry, but, uh, and repetitive, but uh, the theory of justice book contains a section in there on the veil of ignorance. And that concept is primarily intended for lawmakers, but I do find the whole process of it to be very useful in making moral determinations. Um, a lot of people sum it up as empathy, but I think it takes a lot more effort than that because you're considering a lot of different uh, things that maybe instead of just one destination party, you're considering a whole gamut of a lot more. It's, it's something I recommend highly looking into or just look it up on YouTube. There's lots of videos explaining it. The Veil of Ignorance. Okay. Yeah, I was just seeing if we have any more. Looks like we're good to go here. So, uh, uh, Eddie question didn't come up, huh? <laughs> uh, Eddie Chrome de la Chrome. Where can they find you? In France. No, it's um, I'm at uh, Brute Facts on YouTube live every Sunday, Sunday, every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central. Um, tomorrow's show will be at 7 30 special request by the guest um check me out i go live and the videos usually stay up well that's good we don't want them going down that's <laughs> well you know you gotta wonder sometimes <laughs> oh god i was gonna make a joke to shut up Austin. yeah yeah don't uh, do it don't do dr. it dr josh how about you yeah i just wanted to say um i think probably in, in just to throw my two cents in here, the difficulty of this debate, I think, is that it, it sort of hinged um, on this the, the, the moral standard, right? If the question is, the Ten Commandments, are they moral or are they immoral? And could we provide uh, better examples uh, or modify them in such a way to reach, you know, a, a better morality? Um, you almost have to come into the debate into the debate, agreeing on what it is that we mean by morality. And I think, unfortunately, uh, that's a difficult question to, to agree on here. So, I mean, from Gavin's perspective, uh, you know, the biblical texts are the inspired word of God, and therefore God's word is inerrant and um, his commands are holy and just. So there is no there is no question from that perspective. Can they be more moral? No, of course not, because God, you know, is the standard of morality. Um, whereas, of course, Randolph doesn't ad adhere to that. And so trying to then get at uh, what is your basis for morality, because mine is the perfect, uh, you know, the perfect word of God. Uh, and, and it's in, in that per from that perspective, it's more yeah, obviously more perfect uh, you know, to use sort of terrible wording there. But uh, so I, I feel like this didn't it, it wasn't able to get off the ground because there wasn't that, you know, that commonality that we could reach. Um but no, I, I, I enjoyed uh, listening to it, and I appreciate uh, both of you guys, um, how you made my job very easy tonight, I think. Um, but anyway, uh, we are at Digital Hammurabi, Digital H-A-M-M-U-R-A-B-I. Uh, we ancient Near Eastern stuff, ancient Mesopotamia, Sumerian, Akkadian, um, Hebrew Bible, Old Testament stuff. Um, yeah, we we... we we like to cover those sorts of things on our YouTube channel and we're on Twitter and my wife is the brains behind the whole operation. So thanks, Dr. Josh. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks Dr. Josh for being on the ref and uh, keeping these, keeping these wild guys in line. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Eddie, thanks. Uh, last notice or last notice, last minute notice uh, for hanging out with me tonight and, and helping. Uh, definitely appreciate that. But uh, yeah, we are the atheist brown table, and uh, we're actually going to have a, a. I see another question in the chat from Simply Secular. Looks oh, okay. pretty, pretty good, and I think both Gavin and I could probably answer yeah, if if you've got a few more minutes. Come on, Randolph, we were almost done. <laughs> hey, have you ever been to Neil the Six Hundred Four Atheist after parties? He gives these great uh, forty-five minute warnings by saying, "We're going to end the stream in a few minutes." <laughs> <laughs> All right. no, I'm here all night. I don't have anything planned. Shoot away. And, and because we love Simply Secular, we will stick around. Um, and if you don't like it, you can. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so <laughs> could, the, could the average person today write a better list of moral guidelines to live by, which would improve overall quality of life for uh, Gavin and or, or both? Yeah, both. 
I will go first and I'll say, no, I don't think so. The average person, I think, probably could. Um, I, I think it would depend partly on how much thought that average person put into morality and ethics. And uh, if they were trying to, if they were striving to do something better than the Bible, I think it would definitely be a bit easier because they'd have to draw from and be able to do, uh, uh, come up with some comparative things. So um, I think the answer to it is in general, um, I lean toward the yes side on that. Hey, Sorry. congratulations, Pastor Mike. I should tune in for oh, that. Eddie, Eddie missed it. <laughs> I'm sad. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so yeah, we're, we're going to go and wrap it up. And uh, uh, give me one second here. Uh, just to be, be safe. <laughs> um so oh. everybody's been in the chat there's been a bunch of people in there so i won't have uh time to to go through and catch everybody but thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight had a great crowd great conversations going on uh in uh in the chat and uh so so we appreciate that we're gonna have a couple a uh, couple days off here as far as streaming we just went four days back to back to back to back to back to back uh but we'll be uh we'll be back um what's what's today's date the 18th uh so yeah, next week we have a couple more debates. Uh, J. Mike and uh, David Gonzalez are going to be debating on the twenty third. On the twenty third, we have uh, Godless Engineer and um, Jason from Dragons of Genesis coming to uh, debate on who was Jesus uh, with the uh, alternate media crew. Uh, there's some other ones coming up too. But uh, again, thank you guys so much. Uh, any anything you want to say before we uh, before we disappear? I probably should keep it to myself, but that was a great debate, great show. Uh, saw Pasta Mike in there. Love you, Pasta Mike. Uh, and man, it was. We got to do more of these, man. It's uh, if you know what I mean. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, everybody, it's it's Monday. We got a week ahead of us. So um, pull your britches up and uh, get ready for uh, get ready for a good week.